Okay, so today we are going to uh, begin our lecture on a new topic, uh, which is also another way to solve uh, ordinary differential equations, but it's actually a very cool way to solve differential equations. Uh, by It does it by bypassing calculus completely. So that's actually kind of interesting. And this subject goes by the name of Laplace transforms. So the, what are Laplace transforms? Well, first of all, what are transforms? This is an example of a class of uh, what are called integral transforms. Uh, integral transforms, okay? And a transform basically takes a function and transforms it to some other function. That's pretty much it. That's, that's pretty much all it does, okay? So I'm sure that in your quantum mechanics course, you have uh, come across uh, Fourier transforms, if I'm right. Right. Or in, even if not in a quantum mechanics course, in, in something else. Um, this is probably more familiar to many people. Uh, Fourier transforms, for example, uh, if you take a function f of x, right, then you can convert this f of x into a function of a different variable, let us say f of p. Okay. The way you do this is not by uh, making an algebraic change but by doing an integration, okay? So the way you do this is claim that f of p uh, is some constant times dx e to the minus ipx f of x, okay? And then you can then go on. So sometimes people put a tilde up top uh, just to make sure to know that this is a Fourier transform of the function f of x. And then if you know f of p, you can do an inverse Fourier transform and get f of x back. Basically, you now integrate over the variable that you don't want, which is basically p, and you do e to the ipx f of p, f tilde of p, okay? In fact, in quantum mechanics, this is very widely employed. Uh, f of x is called the wave function in position space. You usually call this psi of x in quantum mechanics. Okay. And f of p is called the wave function in momentum space, and you call this psi of p in quantum mechanics. Okay. So if you have not seen this, this is something useful for people interested in physics, but uh, this is a completely general thing. Like uh, there is lots of engineering problems that use this, lots of uh, physics problems that use this signals and all those things use it. Uh, so this is one example of what are called integral transforms, okay? And this function that you wait to uh, do the transform is called the kernel of the transformation, okay? So a Laplace transform is another example of an integral transform. It again takes a function of one variable and converts it into a function of a different variable, okay? And I can actually use this, uh, taken in isolation, of course, this is just an integral transform, but it turns out that in the subject of ODEs, you can use Laplace transform. You can use Laplace transforms to solve ODEs, okay? Now, this is a tall claim because a transform is some kind of an integral that goes from one variable to the other. So we have to have a definite scheme of using, uh, of knowing how to solve ODEs with Laplace transforms. But it, it turns out that this way of solving ODEs is actually very, very simple and not at all complicated. In fact, it is much simpler than the techniques that uh, you have learned thus far. What Laplace transform basically does is it takes a, a differential equation and it transforms it into an algebraic equation, okay? So this class of mathematics where you change uh, calculus problems to purely algebraic problems uh, is the lingo is called operational calculus. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing now is an example of operational calculus. We're gonna be taking ordinary differential equations, which are calculus based, and we're gonna do some mumbo jumbo and convert this to algebraic equation that you can easily solve. Okay, and then from then we, we are gonna guess the solution of the differential equation. 
So if you solve differential equations this way, you really, for example, if I give you a, a homogeneous differential equation, you really don't need to know the solution to the inhomogeneous, uh, sorry, if I give you an inhomogeneous equation, you really don't need to know the solution of the homogeneous equation to solve it. You can just solve it straight away. If I give you an initial value problem, you don't need to know what the general solution is before you can fix the constants. You can just solve it in one go. So it's actually very, very, very useful technique uh, that is applicable in pure mathematics also, but also in many engineering problems, okay? So after all is said and done, we should uh, discuss what the heck is Laplace transform. As I told you, it's an integral transform. It takes one function of one variable and spits out a different fun uh, a function of a different variable, okay? So definition. If f of t is defined for all t greater than or equal to zero, t is some variable, f is some function, its Laplace transform which I will abbreviate as LT is defined as the notation, just like in Fourier transform, you had an F tilde and things like that. The notation for F uh, Laplace transform is if the function is defined with a little, little f, the Laplace transform is defined with a capital F. If the function is a function of little t, Laplace transform is a function of a different variable, which we will call S following your textbook, okay? So another way to write this is the Laplace transform of F of t. Okay. L of F of t is basically a, a function capital F of S, okay? It's not the same little f because the functional form of this is totally different. And this is defined as the integral zero to infinity e to the minus st f of t dt. It's very simple, okay? So if you make a connection to Fourier transform, you see that the Fourier transform, it is defined as the integral dx e to the ipx f of x. Here it is defined as the integral e to the minus st f of t, okay? So uh, in general, if you have an integral transform, it goes in this fashion. It goes like k of st f of t dt, where k is called the kernel of the transform. Okay, so the kernel for the Laplace transform is basically e to the minus s. Kernel of Laplace transform is e to the minus st. Okay, so basically, if I give you a function, the way you calculate the Laplace transform is take the function, weight it with e to the minus st, and integrate from zero to infinity. Okay, nothing could be simpler. But it turns out that in many cases, you don't even have to do this. So we will find many tricks to get to the transforms in a shortcut ways, okay? Now, just like uh, in Fourier transform, if you have f of x, you can go to f of p, or from f of p, you can go back to f of x. The inverse transform is also defined. The inverse Laplace transform also exists, and I can uh, formally invert this function, this, this equation, and write f of t as L inverse of f of, sorry, L inverse of f of s, okay? Now, obviously, if I take the Laplace transform and the inverse Laplace transform of a function, I get the same function back again. So L, L inverse of f would just be f. Okay. So L times L inverse in, in the operator notation is basically an identity operator, okay? So this is the usual notation, regardless of uh, what you do. The notation that we will employ in this course is Notation is if you have a way of function y of t, the Laplace, Laplace transform would be capital Y of S. Okay. This would be L of y of t. This is the notation that we will employ. Okay. The functional form of the Laplace transform would be the capital letter of the same letter used to different uh, used to indicate the function. And the variable is actually different. Okay. The transform has is defined with respect to the variable s. Okay. So given this, let us look at the transform of a few elementary functions, and then we will move on to figuring out certain ways to guess the transforms easily for certain other functions. So 
So the simplest of every function is a constant function. So let us take f of t equal to one for t greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So what is this function? What is the Laplace transform of this function? Well, it is laughably easy. f of s is basically zero to infinity e to the minus st times one times dt, which of course is e to the minus st divided by minus s evaluated from zero to infinity, okay? Which obviously gives you one over s. I will do another simple example. Uh, even though this might seem simple, I will extend this example to uh, define a certain cute operation in Laplace transform. And this example is f of t equals e to the at. Okay. Basically, I'm saying I'm taking this function f of t equals one and multiplying this with e to the at. Okay, where a is some constant, it could be positive or negative or even imaginary for all I care. So what is the corresponding Laplace transform of this function? It is zero to infinity, e to the minus st, e to the at dt, which of course is zero to infinity, e to the minus s minus at dt, okay? And if you integrate this guy, you will obviously get one over s minus a, okay? So basically, if I had f of t equals one, I got one over s, but if I had f of t equal to e to the at times one, I had one over s minus a. So s became s minus a, okay? So we will generalize this concept as we move on. Another way to write the same thing is the Laplace transform of the function e to the at is one over s minus a. Now, uh, if I'm given some combination of e to the at and e to the minus at, uh, it turns out that I can actually solve it in an easy fashion. Well, obviously you can now guess that the Laplace transform of e to the minus at would be just one over s plus a, right? So there is no points for guessing this, but what if I had uh, some combination of e to the at and e to the minus at, like a cosine hyperbolic or sine hyperbolic. It turns out that I can simply use the fact that I know the Laplace transform of the individual guys to figure out the Laplace transform of the uh, combination of the two. And to use this, I will use the property of linearity. Linearity of LT. Okay. This is actually very simple, even though it sounds uh, complicated. Suppose if I have to calculate the Laplace transform of some combination, let us say a f of t plus b g of t. How would I go about doing this? Well, the Laplace transform of this guy is basically plug, plug everything in, in the definition of Laplace transform. So this will be zero to infinity e to the minus st a f of t plus b g of t dt. And since integration is a linear, uh, has the linearity property, I can write this as zero to infinity f of t dt plus b zero to infinity g of t dt, right? So this is basically, now you recognize that this guy is basically the Laplace transform of f of t. And this guy is basically the Laplace transform of g of t. So I can write this entire combination as L of a f of t plus b g of t is basically a times l of f of t plus b times Laplace transform of g of t. Okay. And this can help me solve problems uh, in an easy fashion. For example, if I had, um, excuse me, if I had, for example, uh, my uh, function, let us say, is find L of cos hyperbolic AT, right? Now I can write this function cos hyperbolic AT as L of cos hyperbolic AT basically is L of E to the AT plus E to the minus AT over two, okay? And now I will use the linearity property and write this as since it's the Laplace transform of a sum of two functions, it is the sum of the Laplace transform of the individual functions. So this is basically one half L of e to the at 
plus L of e to the minus 80. Okay. And this obviously is 1 over S minus A plus S plus A, which is S over S square minus A square. So this is another simple way in which you can figure out the Laplace transform of slightly more complicated functions. Another example is the Laplace transform of find Laplace transform of let us say cosine omega t. Okay. Now again, I can write this as cosine cosine omega t is Laplace transform of e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t over two. Okay. And then basically put in a, a equals i omega here and figure it out. Okay. So this will be one half L of e to the i omega t plus L of e to the minus i omega t. So this would be one over S a is i omega. So I'll have s minus i omega because the uh, Laplace transform of e to the at is 1 over s minus a and this is obviously s plus i omega and this is if you add these up you will get uh, s over s square minus omega square and what okay. similarly you can figure out so uh, the, uh, so I will, so this is another problem I assign, find L of sine omega t, okay? And also your book gives you a very, uh, an alternate way of finding uh, the Laplace transform of L of cosine omega t and sine omega t. Please look that up in your textbook, okay? So look up your textbook. The notation I will employ is whatever I assign to you, I will put in a red box from now on. This is simple enough that you can easily do it on your own. Okay. All right. So this is how you look at the Laplace transform of simple functions like uh, cosine, sine, hyperbolic, but there might be other functions that, you know, that you cannot use the Laplace transform. Uh, and uh, in those cases, I think you might have to, uh, you know, sometimes so solve on a uh, case by case basis, but there is also other things that you can do. Okay, so let us uh, look at a couple of examples. Another example is, of course, something that you can easily solve, even though you don't need any tricks for it is uh, is the Laplace transform of a simple function like t to the n, okay? Now, this is actually very simple because you simply have to write L of t to the n, where n is an integer, of course, n equals 0, 1, blah, 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 is e to the minus st, t to the n dt, okay? Now, um, this can be written, now I'll use the, uh, Chain, uh, sorry, what is it? Uh, partial integration formula. I will say that my dv is e to the minus st dt and my u is t to the n. And I can use the u dv formula. So if I use the u dv formula, this will become e to the minus st over minus st to the n evaluated between zero and infinity minus integral e to the minus st over minus s du is n t to the n minus 1 dt. Okay. Now the boundary term vanishes because at, uh, so this is not very clear. So I'll write this t clearly. At t equal to infinity, e to the minus infinity goes to 0. At t equal to 0, e to the minus st becomes 1, but t to the n becomes 0. So in both the limits, this function vanishes. The boundary term vanishes. So I can write this guy as 1 over s integral 0 to infinity, or not 1 over s, rather n over s, e to the minus st 
t to the n minus 1 dt. Okay. But now I recognize that this integral is exactly the same integral that I started with, with n replaced by n minus 1. Okay. So basically, I can use the exact same result, but I'll simply have to write n as n minus 1. So I can write this as n over s, n minus 1 over s, 0 to infinity, e to the minus st, t to the n minus 2 dt. And I can keep going. Okay. So I will write this as n, n minus 1 all the way till one and I'll get n factors of s and finally I will left I'll be left with if I exhaust this n times t to the n minus n becomes zero and all I will have is just the e to the minus st factor okay so this you recognize the e to the minus st integration will give me another factor of one over s so this becomes n factorial divided by s to the n plus one okay so the Laplace transform of t raised to the integer power is basically n factorial divided by s to the n plus one. Okay, so these are all again, um, slightly more complicated than what we just saw, but still rather easy to solve. Now, what happens if I don't restrict n to an integer? So suppose if I have t to the a, and I want the Laplace transform of t to the a, where a is not necessarily an integer. Okay, so again, I can go through something similar, but uh, I will not get a neat factorial because uh, A is not an integer, but uh, hopefully you guys already recognized that, you know, the extension of a factorial for uh, uh, non-integers is the gamma function. So I should expect the gamma function in some form and you can actually show this. So the Laplace transform of T to the A is basically zero to infinity t to the a dt, okay, oops, dt. If you substitute st to be equal to x, then this becomes, the limits don't change because at t equal to zero, x is equal to zero. And if t blows up, x also blows up. So the limits are the same. This becomes e to the minus x. And t to the a now becomes x over s to the a and dt becomes dx over s. So I will have one over s to the one plus a integral zero to infinity, e to the minus x, x to the a dx. Okay. So I've basically transformed this integral to an uh, integral that looks very similar, except that I've gotten rid of the st and gotten uh, the same variable in the exponent and here. Okay, so that is the effect of this transformation. And now I recognize that this integral is basically the definition of the gamma function of a plus one. Okay, so the L of t to the a, if you don't believe me, go back and look at your notes from uh, two lectures ago, where we introduced the gamma functions in the context of the Bessel equation. And you will find that this is the exact same definition for gamma of a plus one. So this is basically gamma of a plus one divided by s to the a plus one. Okay. Now remember that if a was an integer, gamma of a plus one would simply be <clears throat> um, the factorial function and s to the a plus one will give me s to the n plus one. So this will basically uh, collapse to this formula over here. Okay. So these are some of the ways in which you can uh, figure out the Laplace transform of very simple elementary functions, either by direct integration or by using the linearity property of the Laplace transforms. If you are given a sum of two functions, the Laplace transform of that sum is basically the sum of the Laplace transform of the individual functions. Okay. So <clears throat> now let us look at uh, one trick that helps us to solve problems a uh, little quicker. And this goes by the name of S shifting. But this is nothing more than what we've seen uh, already. So basically, you need to figure out when to replace S by S minus A in the transform. Okay. So we saw an elementary example of this, right? So we figured out that if F of T was one, the Laplace transform of one was basically one over S. If f of t was e, sorry, 
e to the a t times one, which is just e to the a t. The Laplace transform of e to the a t times one was one over s minus a. And this turns out to be true in general. So if you know the Laplace transform of a function f of t, you can figure out the Laplace transform of the function e to the a t times that function by taking the Laplace transform of the original function and wherever you see s, replace it by s minus a. Okay. And this is not uh, easy to figure out because the Laplace transform of e to the a t f of t is basically zero to infinity e to the minus s t times the function, which in this case is e to the a t f of t dt. Okay. So this is basically zero to infinity e to the minus s minus a t f of t dt, right? So basically, it's exactly the same as a Laplace transform of f of t, except that the weighting factor, the kernel is not e to the minus s t, but e to the minus s minus a times t. So you can just take the Laplace transform of the original function, and wherever you see s, plug in s minus a. As an example, find the Laplace transform of e to the a t, cosine omega t. Okay. Well, you could do the integration or you could uh, recognize that I already know L of cosine omega t, right? Because I have figured this out. So L of cosine omega t is this guy, s over s square minus omega square. Uh, yes. It should, uh, it should be s square plus omega square. S square plus omega square, where? Uh. Where it's s minus iota omega ah, and s plus nice. iota. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Thank you. S square plus omega square. Right? Good. So I already know the Laplace transform of cosine omega t. So basically, to figure out the Laplace transform of e to the a t times cosine omega t, wherever I see s, I will put in s minus t. That's all. Simple enough. You can actually um, do this integration out and satisfy yourself that this is indeed true. That the Laplace transform of any function is, uh, any function weighted by e to the at is basically the Laplace transform of the original function. But wherever you see yes, you just put in s minus a. This is called the s shifting theorem, but it is just a common sense practical notion. So I can write this in general as the Laplace transform of e to the a t f of t is basically f of s minus a, where f of s is the Laplace transform of the original function f of t. Okay. And again, uh, I can, this is a, a the, the inverse transform exists, and you can always write e to the a t f of t is the inverse transform of f of s minus a. This is also true. Okay. So sometimes people might ask you what the inverse transform is. In fact, there's a very interesting problem in your book that combines all these ideas that we will uh, now look at. Uh, so the problem is this find the inverse, find the inverse. Inverse uh, meaning the inverse Laplace transform of the function of f of s equals 3s minus 137 divided by s square plus 2s plus 401. Okay, so this obviously looks like a rather convoluted example, but it turns out to uh, be rather simple in that it exemplifies some of these ideas and tells you uh, how in practical aspects, some of these very simple ideas can be quite powerful. Now, in general, if you want to find the inverse of this function, it can be a little daunting, but basically all I want is the L inverse of this guy, right? So let me write it this way, 3S minus 137 divided by S squared plus 2S plus 401. The trick in this case is, is to try to get it into a form where you can simply recognize that it is a Laplace transform of an elementary function. For example, if I have something like S squared plus S over S squared plus omega squared, then I can guess that there is a cosine omega t involved somewhere, right? 
And if I have something like an S minus A divided by S minus A squared plus omega squared, I can guess that there is an E to the A T cosine omega T involved. So let us try to get it in this form by using uh, the S shifting and the linearity. So I can write this guy as L inverse. I want it in the S plus A form. So I will add and subtract three on top and I will write this as three times uh, S plus one minus 140. Is this right? Because uh, three minus 140 is basically minus 137. And the denominator I will write as S plus one, the whole square. And that will be a square plus two S plus one. And what remains is a factor of 400, which I can write as 20 squared. Okay, so even though I started with a function that looks uh, very unwieldy, I can get it into a form where I can start to recognize things. So this is basically L inverse. Now I'll use linearity. So I'll write this as the Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform of two different functions. I will write this as three times L inverse S plus one divided by S plus one square plus 20 square minus, I will write this as seven times L inverse 20 Okay, now uh, why I wrote it the first uh, way should be obvious to you because you can recognize this form emerging, right? So S minus A divided by S minus A whole square plus omega square. So I can recognize that omega here is 20 and A here is minus one. And the way, the reason I wrote it in this form, the second part is because L of E to the A T sine omega T is basically omega divided by S minus A whole square plus omega square. Because the Laplace transform of sine omega T is basically omega divided by S square plus omega square, okay? So this has the form of the E to the A T cosine omega T inverse Laplace transform. And the second guy has the form of E to the A, A T sine omega T Laplace transform. So here is an example where A equals minus one and omega equals 20, okay? So the inverse Laplace transform of the original unwieldy function is basically three times e to the minus t because a t is uh, e to the minus t cosine 20 t minus seven times e to the minus t sine 20 t, okay. which you can, you can take the e to the minus out t, e, e to the minus t out common and write this as three times cosine 20 times t minus seven sine 20 times t, okay? So you can recognize that, you know, this is the solution of a damped harmonic oscillator. So if you re recognize, uh, if you put in a damping term in the second order differential equation, there is always an e to the minus uh, of lambda t that comes into play, which tells you that the oscillator is going to stop vibrating after a while, that's it. And of course, it, is, it should also have an oscillating component. So that's why you have the cosine and the sines. So you start with something very algebraic, right? So you, you start with a function of S that looks like three S plus blah, 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 divided by whatever. And then at the end of it all, your uh, what emerges is the solution for a uh, <clears throat> damped simple harmonic oscillator. So you can already recognize that, you know, uh, I can turn this operation around and uh, basically start with the differential equation and figure out the Laplace transform. And if I figure out the Laplace transform, all I need to do is basically uh, check check what function this is the Laplace transform of, and that will give me the solution of the differential equation. So we'll talk about we'll talk about this in more detail tomorrow. Uh, but before I do that, I will just uh, talk uh, a little bit about existence and uniqueness. It is not terribly important, but it is useful to keep in mind. A uniqueness of Laplace transforms. Okay. Now, the way Laplace transforms is defined, <clears throat> I'll first talk about this roughly. So L of f of t is zero to infinity e to the minus st f of t dt, right? <clears throat> so to understand if such an integration is well-defined, you first have to understand if, uh, for example, it blows up or not, right? Now we are already uh, in uh, good shape because there is an e to the minus st factor there. Right? As long as s is some positive constant, 
the e to the minus st function is going to guarantee that this thing converges, right? Unless f of t is really, really badly behaved, right? So for example, if f of t goes like e to the 10 t square, then such a function might not have a good Laplace transform because this fun this integration is not well defined, right? As uh, you keep increasing t, the e to the 10 t square term grows way faster than e to the minus st suppresses it. But for all ordinary functions that you know are not this badly behaved, uh, the Laplace transform exists because of this factor of e to the minus st that is the kernel of the Laplace transform. So more generally, if f of t is such that it doesn't grow faster than an exponential, then I can make sure that uh, the Laplace transform exists, right? So I can uh, state this as a theorem, if you, if you so wish. If f of t is defined and piecewise continuous, on every finite interval in the semi-axis t greater than oops t greater than equal to zero and satisfies the absolute value of f is bounded by some exponential factor for all t greater than or equal to zero and for some constants m and k then the laplace transform l of f of t exists for all s greater than k. Now that's a whole lot of words, but it's actually very easy to understand. So forget this piecewise continuous term for now, and uh, let us see what this really tells. So if f of t is bounded and by some exponential factor, right? So the most that f of t can grow like is some e to the kt. So what what happens if I put uh, f of t is e to the my e to the kt over there? The l becomes zero to minus t, e to the minus st, m, e to the kt, dt, right? So this basically becomes m, zero to infinity, e to the minus s, minus kt, dt, right? So as long as um, k is less than s, right? As long as s is greater than k or whatever you want to say, this integration is well-defined, right? So what we are basically saying is that the function can grow, no problem. It can even grow like an exponential, but it cannot grow like an exponential faster than e to the minus st converges, right? So if, e, if the kernel is e to the minus, let us say, uh, some st, the function cannot grow faster than that because if it grows faster than that, the integration is not well-defined because as t grows more and more, uh, you're going to accumulate more and more stuff at the very end. So it basically means that the integration diverges. That cannot happen. So the f of t has to be bounded. The absolute value of f of t has to be bounded. And this bound uh, is can be at most an exponential growth with an exponential constant k, which is less than s. Okay, If k is greater than s, again, I have a problem because this exponent becomes positive And again, it contributes a lot at t equal to infinity. So as long as this k is less than s, I'm golden. Okay, so that is what this theorem states. And f of t need not even be a completely smooth and continuous function in the interval, can be piecewise continuous. I'm guessing all of you know what piecewise continuous functions are. It means that, you know, the function can uh, behave like this, right? All it, uh, all it tells you is that a piecewise continuous uh, function is if I look at any finite interval, uh, it's continuous in the finite interval, which simply means that if I approach a limit from the left and the right, I should get the exact same thing. Okay. So the function can be piecewise continuous or completely continuous. That is even easier on every finite interval. And the semi-axis, because uh, the integration is only valid from zero to infinity, not minus infinity to infinity, and satisfies this bound, then the Laplace transform exists. Okay. And uh, 
As far as the uniqueness is concerned, if the Laplace transform exists, usually it means that it is also unique. So it basically means that I cannot have uh, two different functions that have the exact same Laplace transform. So if you if usually if f, L of f of t exists, then uh, the Laplace transform of a function is also unique. Okay. So we might not have to deal with this in a practical uh, case many in many cases because the functions that you will be dealing with mostly uh, do not grow faster than an exponential. But in case they do, you should be aware and, and claim that the Laplace transform in this case does not exist. Okay. But for most functions of practical use, this is not a problem. So we will stop here for today. And tomorrow we will talk about uh, the Laplace transforms of derivatives. And uh, then we will start using these concepts to solve ordinary differential equations. Okay. So I'll stop here for today. And uh, if you have any questions, please do ask.